Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Georgia and um, I'm here at Zaratan for a month. Um, and I thought I'd just start by sort of talking a little bit about my practice. Um, and then sort of a little bit about uh, the residency and the work that I've put on um, for this exhibition. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, um, so here's some examples of my prints. Um, and I, so I work as a visual artist, but primarily I see myself as a, a printmaker and, and that's where my training comes from. Um, I studied painting and printmaking at Glasgow School of Art. Uh, um, and I graduated in 2018 and since then I've been working as sort of a, a freelance printmaker um, and I have my own practice selling my own work um, and doing exhibitions and I also work as a, a mural artist and an illustrator on the side um, and my work is very it's very site specific so I I find that uh, the theme with it that sort of that flows through all of my pieces and all of my prints um, relates to where I am, my location, where I'm living, my surroundings, um, often heavily influenced by sort of nature, um, maybe the like sort of interiors of buildings or uh, the architecture of them. Um, and often this work sort of exists outside of, uh, say, like a studio space. Uh, I find that certainly since graduating, um, and I, I, I move around a lot and I do a lot of artist residencies. So having access to say a traditional printmaking studio is not necessarily the easiest thing to come by. Um, and <coughs> this is very true with the pandemic as well. It, it sort of, uh, yeah, I sort of started learning how to create um, outside of the sort of traditional spaces that I was used to, um, which means that now my art is uh, often quite sort of digitally focused. And I brought like, um, a drawing tablet in uh, 2019, the year after I graduated, and uh, I'd sort of taught myself how to paint and create sort of print layers digitally, and then I sort of have developed that into a practice in itself, um, and I also uh, sort of found the technique of risograph <coughs> printing, um, and uh, I've sort of been really focused on that ever since because um, I find risography really interesting. And I have training sort of with very like traditional printmaking, like etching um, and lithography and serigraphy. But uh, risograph printing, I really like it because it's sort of uh, it's similar to screen printing. It's, it's sort of uh, a very stencil-based like practice, and it's really simple. Um, but it's also uh, a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible um, and a lot more sustainable than most traditional printmaking mediums. Um, so you can see uh, there is. I have uh, two images here. One of them is a digital uh, image, and one of them is a, like a risograph printed image. And they're just inspired by my surroundings at the time. So one of them was an experience that I had uh, sort of out in nature um, by a river seeing an eel uh, and the other ones the interior of a house that I was living in at the time uh, and I create these sort of like dreamy kind of um, often see there's some more of my risograph prints here but I create like a they're often sort of like inspired by landscape and location but also kind of quite ethereal and illustrative and sort of uh, narrative um, and even though they're sort of quite maybe fantastical for me it's a sort of a way of grounding myself in where I am because it's a way of me sort of interpretate like interpreting my surroundings and um, translating that into a print and it's sort of a way of it's really cathartic and I find it it helps me sort of find like solace and, and um, sort of get in touch with where I am at, at any one time and uh, I yeah I, it, for me it's it's all about the enjoyment of the process and I really love that and that's why I love printmaking because um, it's such a process based practice um, and it's very so these are these are risograph prints that are, I have here um, that I'm showing you and you can see it's they're three color prints but um, you can, even though you're only using three colors, you can build up such uh, sort of like translucent textures and tonalities and you can um, really experiment and play with it. And it can be very simple um, and very small um, and very sort of, uh, sort of very basic like color driven uh, processes, but it can also be quite sort of complex and you can really build like layers, um, which I really love. I really love experimenting with it. Um, it's amazing. Um, and this is an example here, um, sort of when talking about how site-specific my work is. Um, this is a print that I did, it's a digital print. 
um, and it was based on uh, this sort of uh, the residency space that I was living in at the time um, last year in Italy um, and sort of the natural light of the space became like a big part of all the work that I created um, and then I sort of created a series of very like colorful um, imagery uh, intertwined with sort of like like sort of listening to and um, repeating the architecture of the space and I often use like motifs and sort of like uh, little uh, sort of repetitive like sort of themes or images within my work um, that maybe connect to sort of dreams I've had or sort of um, things that I love or things from my childhood so often things like uh, birds and owls and plants feature a lot like sort of flowing through my work so even though the locations change perhaps the subject matter might stay the same um, but even though so the the prints that I've just been showing are quite sort of they were digitally created a lot of them it, it for me it all starts still very like traditionally so I use uh, sort of the this skill and the training that I've had through my sort of very like traditional like degree that I did very specialized um, to kind of everything like starts from that um, and I'll do like just quick sketches of my like location surroundings um, just like um, and like also printing directly from the landscape so here there's a it's a monoprint um, which is basically just like it's a really simple form of printmaking like relief printmaking and you can um, just directly literally take from the landscape like here I've taken uh, like a leaf and then you can print with it and it's just a really nice way of exploring texture and, and how that translates into printmaking media um, which I really like playing around with and here's another example um, of me just like working out compositions for prints and all of my sort of colors usually I'll start with say like soft pencil or uh, sketches and then uh, usually the sort of like that ends up informing the the final sort of like color schemes for the prints um, so it all stays even though the finished images are maybe quite connected to like digital processes it, it for me I always feels quite organic still and then by then sort of taking digital prints and often printing them as risographs they then become organic again which I really like it becomes very sort of like yeah, I don't know. I think I, I like it to be uh, as natural as it can be, um, even though the processes that I'm using are often quite sort of like technical. Um, and I do, so as well as making my own prints that are themed on, um, you know, what I'm interested in, uh, I also do like commercial work. Uh, so like this uh, was a print I was commissioned to do this year. Um, by a print company in Slovakia and they gave me like a, a theme it was like a narrative of a uh, folktale um, and I created a three color risograph print from it um, and I really I enjoy this kind of um, I really enjoy this kind of like uh, narr like following a narrative or a theme within my prints and I, I find that when I was younger I was quite influenced by things like Studio Ghibli um, and other sort of like cinematic um, forms of art and things like Tim Burton and, and stuff it was a sort of a big influence on how I interpreted the world I think visually and as a creative so I think there's maybe sometimes something quite sort of story um, sort of tropey and, and sort of cinematic in the, sort of the way I print as a result of that um, which is something I really enjoy um, and as well as doing print commissions I also do um, other things as well. So, for example, last month uh, I won a grant to uh, turn one of my print designs into a, a massive mural, um, which was really great fun. Uh, and it was really interesting because that was something that I had never done before. Uh, and I had to teach myself how to use uh, spray paint, which was quite interesting. But I, I went to it with the exact same approach that I have with my printmaking, which is all about building layers of colour. Um, and it was really lovely actually because. I was able to, normally my prints are sort of lifted from spaces and they sort of, uh, and I often try and maybe, you know, uh, connect back with that space or, you know, talk and interact with the community that maybe I'm sort of doing a print um, with or if I'm on a residency. But here it was great because it was so direct, you know, it was like I was working directly with the space, with the architecture on a wall and also engaging with the community, which was, I found it really rewarding. It was really good fun.
where so it's in London. This um, uh, yeah, this mural that I did, um, and it's in like a, a park called Bollowbrook. Um, so basically, it was like a, the project was uh, funded through Central Saint Martins, um, and it was it brought together. Um, the local community and then also the school that's um, sort of opposite Bollybrook Park and they voted in uh, their favourite design and then from that I then went and talked to the school children and we um, created this sort of, uh, we, it was like a sort of a big, uh, we wanted fun, colour, nature, the sort of thing that fits in this sort of lovely big parkscape that they had. Um, yeah, um, and it was really nice. And I ran some workshops and uh, taught some sort of kids uh, how to do spray painting. Um, and that was also really nice because it felt like I was giving back and it was making, you know, it makes art accessible. And I really like this idea of, and it's why I like risographic like printing because it's this idea of like art being accessible and it not being something that's necessarily institutionalized and it's the same with printmaking like I, I yeah I like the idea of it being something fun and it's for everyone rather than just yeah sort of within that sort of very traditional printmaking gaze that uh, often comes with the sort of yeah the media um, but uh, yeah which is why I kind of uh, I really love doing artist residencies um, and this one is actually a residency that I did in Porto two years ago um, and we ran lots of workshops on printmaking um, with the other artists, but also just with like random people in the community, um, which was lovely because uh, it was really nice. I love seeing how people who maybe don't even come from sort of a creative background approach something like printmaking because I think people often think it's very technical and then all of a sudden they're like, oh no, I'm going to just do it my way. And you learn so much from seeing how other people approach it. Um, so I always find that really nice and refreshing. Um, and I'm always really grateful to organizations that allow me to do this. So Because without having the spaces like Zaratan here, um, I would not be able to, yeah, I wouldn't be able to go and, and do these things. So um, it's like a massive influencer on my, my practice. Um, and on sort of how I choose to work as an artist um, and it's something I really love which brings me on to what I've been doing at Zaratan so um, here I, um, I really wanted to just directly so every time I go into a residency I approach it as if it's like a whole new experience and I don't go into it with an idea particularly of what I want to do and I always try and keep it very organic so the purpose is that I'm going somewhere and I'm experiencing that place and I'm creating work um, that I have like lifted directly from that place um, and I think that really helps challenge me as an artist because it means that you know you're creating work you might not not have necessarily expected to have to create but it also I think really helps develop my practice as an artist and it makes me feel like I'm I don't know getting more in touch with a space when I'm creating work directly with or um, like as a part of it so uh, here um, I focus just sort of very locally and I just uh, took sort of did sort of lots of sketches and drawings and digital paintings from um, sort of the streets of Lisbon, um, just my local area and things that caught my eye, um, building up like a small sort of portfolio of uh, prints. Uh, and then I decided to try a new um, approach, like a way of translating them back into um, the gallery at Zaratan um, that sort of uh, would, I wanted to find a medium that would sort of uh, capture this idea of these like spontaneous and temporary prints that I was creating. Um, so therefore I um, sort of taught myself how to transfer print, um, which uh, all the works in the show here that I've done are transfer prints. Um, and it's a very uh, interesting, <coughs> very destructive process uh, that is designed for uh, textiles. and. Um, Basically, normally it's a way of transferring an image onto fabric, um, but here I did it directly onto the walls of the gallery, um, which uh, has created this really lovely effect where you get these prints that are sort of very uh, worn and they sort of they're very organic, they're very natural, and they respond. Each print responds directly to the wall because as you're layering on your print, it you have to like it, it changes depending on the texture of the wall, and it, it's really nice because they they're directly responding and 
uh, present in the space, but they're also only there for a very limited amount of time while the show um, is happening. So um, I thought it was a this and then to also feedback. Um, and I think, like for me, the sort of temporary nature of the prints sort of is a really nice reflection of my temporary presence here at Zaratan. Um, and how I feel living and working in this sort of space uh, during my stay. And also it's a reflection of uh, cityscapes. Um, everything's very busy, everything's changing all the time. Um, creatives and uh, workers and businesses are flowing in and out of the space. Everything's in flux. And I think, um, yeah, I wanted to sort of challenge my normal uh, perspective on printmaking where you walk into a place and you create a very <coughs> set final edition of work and then that edition is something you, you, know, you take with you, you promote, you sell, whereas here it was very like, I'm just going to respond to this busy city, create something and then and leave and it's gone and um, yeah, it's been really fun and really interesting and I've learned an entire new process um, which I've really enjoyed uh, because it's been very sort of, uh, yeah, it's been hit and miss. It's been, it, because it's not designed to necessarily uh, as a sort of form of mural making as, as something that you would put onto a wall. It's, uh, the results have been varied. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting process. So you have to use, um, you have to use laser jet images, uh, like as in, so basically just your very cheap, very easily accessible printer. Um, if you go to a print shop, it's a laser jet uh, printer, and it, they have this lovely, like, glossy sort of ink, uh, which comes off really well onto a wall. If you were to use inkjet, uh, it wouldn't work as well, uh, which is the other sort of like common um, type of printer. Uh, but because the the inks, it's much less uh, like grounded. Uh, basically, it would just the ink would run because it's a water-based process of removal, um, and the glue that you use, the transfer medium. Um, is the, certainly the one I've been using is acrylic based um, and it's like a, a water um, based medium and you would just literally spread the glue on the page stick the page to the wall and then straight away uh, you just you apply water uh, and I just gently you start to rub away uh, the excess paper with the image so you can see here these two that you can see that there is still um, the paper is left on the image and I've just been rubbing away at the other parts of it and you can um, it's a very sort of very lovely tactile soft slow process um, which is really nice and it's very the image sort of reveals itself really slowly um, and some of the images lifted, some of the inks lifted away, um, depending on how well it's stuck to the wall. So it's really nice. You get this sort of very textured, tactile, worn um, sort of aesthetic coming out of it, which is really interesting. It kind of has this like fresco quality, which I really love. It, I feel like it connects really well with the wall. Um, yeah, which I, I really, uh, really enjoy. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it's a slow process, but I think that's actually really nice. And it's made, uh, for me as a printmaker, it's, again, it's been a way of taking something that was digital and bringing it back into the medium of tactile uh, art and sort of traditional, sort of more creative processes, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I thought I'd just show, there's a few little details here of um, the prints, and I just thought I'd show the locations that had inspired them. Um, so they, they're just sort of selected from, from gardens and little spots and colours. Mostly, I think, for me, a big part of the inspiration has been how, I mean, the colours of Lisbon are just incredible. The sunlight here is amazing. And I think I just wanted to translate some of that into my prints um, and absorb a little bit of that. Um, and it's really, um, it's been a really fun experience for me actually, um, just really focusing on these locations and, and drawing them. Um, and I'm really happy with the results. I think, um, yeah, I think I've learned a lot um, and I'm very grateful to Zaratan for letting me practice on their beautiful gallery walls. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can just leave them up, I don't have to take them down. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, I don't know, I think it's, a, it's certainly a technique that I want to continue trying in different spaces. And I think it really fits with the whole site like specific nature of my practice, having something that is so like organically in touch with the, the place that I'm, I'm working in.
Um, yeah, and if anyone wants to, anyone here would like to um, practice it, I, um, I have some images and I can show you how to do it if you would like. Because I feel like it's the sort of process that I can talk about it, but actually the best way to do it is, because it's so tactile, <laughs> is to literally rub the image, like to do it yourself. You have to like really experience it. Um, but yeah, and, and that's basically it, guys. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs> okay, so, I have some yeah, fire away, guys. Okay, what is the name of your project? The name. And what, why is it called? What is it called? So the exhibition title um, is uh, When the Clouds Touch the Ground. Um, and the, the title actually came from like our first meeting that we had at Zaratan. And uh, Jose <laughs> was trying to explain uh, fog. And, um, and he was like, oh, it's, you know, it's like when, when the clouds are in the ground. And I was like, that's such a beautiful, that's way more beautiful than fog. Like, I love, I love that. The, the, but it was, it was one of those lovely moments where something becomes more beautiful when it's like lost in translation, which I think is kind of like, it really fit with the prints because you rub things away and things get lost and it's yeah, all very... It suddenly makes sense <coughs> because there is the on the ground is something so ephemeral. Yeah. And then there is a touch between ephemeral ethereal element. It, and I think yeah. what's happening here is very similar. There is an ephemeral action touching a physical space and... And then it lifts. I took a few times. And then it's gone. It <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the whole time I've been creating my work when I was like, that that's just the phrase that phrase is just stuck in my head and then when you mentioned you want an exhibition title and I was like I know exactly what I want <laughs> um, but yeah it's a lovely expression and I feel like um, it really uh, connects with these pieces that I have because um, yeah as you say there's that lovely organicness to it yeah where did you learn this practice as in uh, transfer, uh, well, I, I, arguably I'm still learning it and I don't know if I've really learned it yet. I'd never done it before coming here um, and I didn't know if it was going to work. But last time I came here and I was, uh, when I was in Porto, we did some like posters. So you, you, know, you mix like rice and you mix water together and then you slap it up on the wall. Um, and I really liked, and the reason I, I like it was really, nice to try that um, and we did like a lot of that just out in the streets um, and I kind of thought oh actually that was really and we only did it like a we didn't do that many I, I mostly did monoprints when I was last here uh, and I was like oh maybe I'll try that again <coughs> and then I thought actually I want something that's more immersive and less sort of I wanted something that was a little less linked to say maybe like printmaking and I wanted it to be less sort of poppy poster art and something that was a little more organic and this well, it seems to have worked okay. <laughs> um, I literally just, yeah, I tried it. At first I tried it on paper and it didn't work at all. Um, and then I tried it on a tote bag and it worked a little bit. And then trying it on the walls um, of the studio space was just sort of how it all came together really. Um, and just learning the best way to do it. Um, but I'm still, yeah, like I say, I'm still learning. It's very new to me. Um, but I've always, with my printmaking, it's always, I find the best way for me to learn is often self Taught. So with the digital art, I did, just did it all myself, and with the risograph printing, I learned the process of the layers all in just entirely uh, myself, and it was very slow. Um, but it was, I feel like, the, as a result, the way that I work is very personal to me, and it's very unique to me. And you might not necessarily see someone using transfer printing with this in this medium, um, but I think that's quite nice for me that it's something that's like very sort of personal and precious. Yeah, yeah I, I have some comment and question. Uh, like, first, I really appreciate how you were challenging yourself about creating uh, a new technique and kind of experimenting and not knowing where to go and still persuading and everything goes so smoothly. <laughs> well, <laughs> because it worked uh, beautifully. And I think for me, what is very sexy about it is that your 
main work was on paper, and suddenly uh, you have some experience with mural, which I believe yeah. when you engage with the community, when it's proper done, and uh, it, it's something very meaningful, and this idea of being uh, not not forever, maybe, but really stuck in time, it, it's so important. Yeah. And, this idea of size specific has been explored by you. And I think this technique is a kind of a way to enter into mirrors, but can be so much ephemeral because we don't know, but we suppose it will be come out very, very easily, which is also something. Yeah. Um, I don't know, we, we have commented this during these few weeks that it gives it this idea of being bold and yeah. uh, looking like a scrub down fresco. Yeah, yeah. Which is very special about it and I think it can drive you to, I don't know, to another dimension by exploring that or maybe not and you should switch because you go in another place. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, because because it's something that I've done here. I don't know whether I will take it and and you know carry it on, but I think I will. I think it's something that I really I still want to work with. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because it is a way of me sort of combining. Obviously, last month in August, I was doing this massive, uh, like huge mural. Um, let's see if I can find them, um, which was obviously it's designed to be very permanent um, and it's in an outside space and I had to learn a whole new sort of, whoa, oh I've gone too far, <laughs> me in tech, hey, <laughs> this is me, like I love digital art, I can handle it, it's here. It's oh, here. Whoa. oh my goodness gracious, there we go, okay, yeah. so like with this it was really interesting because obviously the whole point was it's supposed to be very permanent. Um, but it was that, and but it was also very like the working with the space and working with the wall was so key. Normally, as a printmaker, you would select your paper depending on what you want your design to be, and it's all very like finished and polished. And and here it was like, oh, okay, so there's a wasp's nest here in this wall. We can't necessarily go and paint around this bit. And then it was literally like we were, and like bricks were coming out of the wall when we were working. It was very like, you just had no idea what was going to happen. And actually that was really kind of great um, and really interesting. And also it was interesting to take my like print design and then change that and change the medium. So maybe that experience as well that I've had of last month like sort of forcing myself outside of my comfort zone I think you get like a hunger for it don't you you know you want to learn something new um, but also it's interesting because it, it's totally different like when I came here I was thinking oh maybe I'll do another mural like this but what I've created is completely like it just doesn't look anything like this and I think it's really interesting that these two sort of I don't know that like within one sort of practice and mindset and approach you can have two things that are totally different um, but yeah, it's really interesting. I really like the sort of, as you say, the like temporary sort of fresco sort of style of the things that I've created. There's also something that, in my perception, like maybe it was because uh, you were in residency together, so the two work were very in contrast. Yeah. But you often mm -hmm. describe your work saying it's very colorful and it's very happy. But in the end, I feel there is a lot of tension in, in the work in the sense that to make images for the real, for the real world, mm. like a figure of a person laying on the street or uh, yeah. birds uh, appearing on a... <laughs> for me it's not that... I mean they are beautiful between how to say. They can be nice but I think they can be very disturbing as well. I they don't are. See them as so... People yeah. always say that. I always say my work's really happy and people say it's just a bit strange because actually it'll be like figures staring out in, from like, you know, forest scapes or it'll be like, uh, you know, I mean like that woman with the eel that I had, like, yeah, like an owl on a chair which was inspired by a dream I had and like people will be like, actually, 
you interpret this as something that you find very cathartic, but actually, the, like, and you find it, I find it rewarding, but, like, I think as, a, as an observer, they are quite surreal and they're quite strange, which maybe I think links back to what I was saying about how when I was a child and I, I looked at sort of interpretate, like, like interpreting landscape um, as art and I was really a big fan of like Studio Ghibli and that those kind of like big cinematic visuals and actually the sort of the, the themes that flow through that, they're very, they're beautiful, but they're also quite dark. And I think that's really, that's really nice. And like, I, you know, when I was making these, the idea of them being quite temporary and the idea of them being destroyed in the process of making them, it was all quite sort of like, there was something a little bit, uh, I don't know, melancholy about the process. And it was also a bit like, oh, you know, my time here has been so lovely and it's been uh, really gorgeous and really interesting. Um, but again, it's very temporary. And it's felt really temporary, I think, because the exhibition was sort of three weeks after I arrived. And it, so it's felt very much like I've been creating work knowing that soon it's going to it's going to be over and I'm moving somewhere else and I'm doing another residency so I think even the way I was looking at it was almost like nostalgic when I was looking at Lisbon through this you do that where you sort of you see something and you think oh I'm going to remember this but it's like really bizarre that you perceive the world that way but then yeah I feel like that's kind of come through a little bit in these in these pieces and there's always I even though I take say architecture as you say, and I take my surroundings, I, I love using, like, throwing in these sort of, like, motifs, like the birds or, like, figures and, and, like, just bringing something into it that's a little bit more ethereal and, it, like, sort of, yeah, that has a, there's, there's a, maybe a little bit of a narrative in there and you don't know where it's come from, but I, I really always, yeah, I really like the fact that that flows through my work. Does anyone else want to ask anything or maybe we're about ready to wrap up? Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Do you want to take over?
the, the other artist that's here living in Saratán. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about myself. And I, I'm, 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 I want to give you guys context of who I am because my work is extremely autobiographical. And it's just a reflection of everything that's happened to me. And for you to kind of understand, I, I want to give you context. Okay, so I was born in Mexico uh, in a city called Monterrey. It's highly, highly conservative and traditional. I was born on, uh, on a very Catholic and strict household. Um, and right now I am, I am expressing myself through photography. I, did, I, had my, I got my bachelor's degree in photography last year, so yeah. And I'm really interested in identity, in sexuality, and in what makes a human a human, okay? And like I said, I am obsessed with oversharing and the dramatization, dramatization of my work. Okay, so like, ah, uh, yeah, I grew up in Mex in Monterey. This is a uh, this is a picture. It's not mine. Oh, and my medium is photography. And so, okay, so here I'm gonna tell you about myself. So, growing up, I felt the need to rebel against like my conservative family. So that's when I found the internet. And so my family was really, really strict and they didn't let me go outside, but I had this laptop that let me search whatever I wanted from a very, very young age. And yeah. So by the time that I, that I started to get to know the internet, Mexico was having a huge problem with drugs and cartels. And both my parents never told us, like m me and my siblings, because I mean, we didn't know and we lived in a really safe place. But one time I heard my cousin, my older cousins talking about a narco blog on the internet. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? And so I looked it up and it was basically a website with a lot of gory images of people being slaughtered, videos of people being beheaded. And I, I don't know, I got like addicted <laughs> to reading it at a very young age. I was 12. And so my parents obviously never knew they would really disapprove. And so I became desensitized to like murder and gory images and videos. And that, 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 that happened to me really impacted me and who I am right now. So, and so my fears and, and everything I was consuming manifested through my nightmares, but I couldn't <laughs> stop reading the blog. I was hooked I was literally addicted to horror even though it scared me so much like I wouldn't sleep but I I couldn't stop so then it translated to watching horror movies and just like trying to research like the worst and most horrible horror movies ever so and I I, I, I was like 13 so it was I it was a time where you're a literal sponge and everything that's happening in your surrounding you're consuming and it's shaping who you are so yeah, so then horror movies would be my safe zone because whenever I felt like sad or depressed, I rather felt scared than sad or depressed. So whenever I felt sad, <coughs> I would just watch another horror movie. So all this is super relevant because it shaped who I am today. And mostly in my art, it translates, I think, very well because usually my themes in, in all my projects and ideas incline more towards the mysterious and the dark and the scary and yeah so this is a context about my series that's called this is a feeling you thought you had repressed and it's the series that i showed uh in the exhibition and yes so like i said i'm extremely autobi autobiographical and confessional when it comes to my work like I, like I said, so I always felt the, the need of oversharing through my art, using it like a diary, I don't know. Like for me, maybe it's wrong, but I felt if I don't publish my thoughts and feelings, they're not valid. And that's because when I was younger, I would repress absolutely everything. Like I, I didn't feel safe enough in like my family to express myself or to feel or whatever 
because they were really strict and they would really disapprove. So, so th this is about, okay, now this is my series. So when I was younger, I was uh, diagnosed with Adderall. Um, I mean, diagnosed with ADHD, with me, which means attention hyperactiveness disorder. And I was given a pill every day in order to control myself, and I, like by a doctor. And I didn't even know when, what I was taking. I just listened to the doctors and the professionals. So I took it every day for a, around six or seven years. And there were some intense side effects. Um, I, my personality was just numb. I didn't feel anything. My friends knew that I was acting weird. I would not laugh. I would not joke like I used to. So, and then I stopped taking the med medication when I entered university and that's when I realized that I had become like addicted to it. And like my hair started falling off. <coughs> I had really bad acne. I gained a lot of weight. And so this is a story of taking the medication, taking the medication, stopping the use of it, and realizing I had become dependent, and then finding myself, my unfiltered and sober self again. So this it, this is the feeling you thought you had repressed. Okay, so if you guys go to the exhibition, I'm gonna um, talk about the pieces individually and starting from the number one, that's this one, it's called Pilot. Um, I just felt, in my, my work is really dark, but it also has a lot of colors, intense colors. With red, usually it means it, it's about sexuality. Uh, and the blues usually mean like anxiety, depression, or just all of that. And so with this image, I, I felt like a target in my own family. Like I felt like I was the the, problem to everything and that's why I kind of did it and that this is called the politics of oversharing that it's this image is really um, it's not sharp it's not sharp it, you, you it's kind of blurry and that's how I felt I felt a strong longing for something in this case sexuality or, or discovering myself through feelings and like that so yes this is what it means and then the scream, this is one of my favorites because it's, it's a, this one is my interpretation or my way of my, the scream by Edward, Edward Munch. And yeah, so it's about m me feeling trapped or not being able to talk or, or see everything correctly because I was under this strong medication with, which literally deleted all my feelings. And so yeah. So I'm trying to scream, but nobody is hearing me scream because I'm there's no mouth, basically. <laughs> and then this one, it's called "If It Ends, It's Okay," which I love. I also really like this picture. It's taken in Texas after after COVID hit. So this place that I used to frequent a lot shut down, and for me it was like maybe I exaggerated, but it was really hard for me to see this like huge place, huge bar, and like. A place where people could go shut down because it wasn't useful for the, the owners anymore like oh you're not producing money we're not benefiting benefiting from you so we're gonna shut you and ignore you completely and I it's like a metaphor for what I felt in my family or whatever and so this is called La Censura which I which I it's me and like kind of trapped in this box and wanting and pleading to get out but i couldn't i was just trapped and and i also have this weird thing it's not a fetish but it's a fascination for hands i love hands i feel like they're the most beautiful thing a human has like the way they move well my veins are really you can really see them and my bones kind of dance when i move so i love hands like they're everywhere and so yeah and then this is a five hour ego death, which it was usually, it, it was named something before, but then I changed it. And this is about all the feelings that I would like bottle up inside me when I was taking the medication and I couldn't feel like anger, sadness, joy, pain, love, and whatever, because this pill really completely murdered my feelings. So all of those feelings, I felt like they were inside my stomach, just bottled up. and. 
And yeah, and this is the, the title's a reference to uh, doing mushrooms because it's, or psilocybin or whatever, because it kills your ego for a couple of hours. So yeah. And this is, I love, I really like this picture. It's called Stop the Clocks and Cover the Mirrors. It's a reference to death. When people were, when people died years ago, they would stop the clocks and cover the mirrors. And this, so I sometimes felt spasms of like, of like clarity when I was under the medication because it, it would go away, like the effect of the medication would go away. If I took it like at 7 a.m., it would go away at like around 5 p.m. So uh, sometimes I would get like clar flashes of clarity of like, what am I doing? Why am I having to take this medication every single day for years and years? Like I don't even know myself. I don't even like myself. So yeah. And this is called Flood. And because I just felt like completely drowning in my own thoughts and my anxiety and my depression and everything. And I am the one who is like um, suffocating myself because I can blame my parents all I want for making me take the medication. But at the end of the day, I wasn't the one who asked questions like, why am I taking this thing called Adderall every single day? So it's my fault. Like I can't blame anyone else. And this is called Sad Hot Girl Club. Um, it's me a, a couple of times and just like, it, I, as you can see, I never have eyes. I don't really want to put eyes because I felt like I was, I wasn't seeing anything and I was just like completely blinded by the medication. And yeah. And this is called the bitch imposter, which is myself. Like, um, sometimes like I would hear voices that like would talk really shitty about myself. Like I would talk to myself really badly and I was the imposter in my own head. And this is double the dose because uh, at a certain point they up <coughs> my dose and I don't understand why. But also this is supposed to be like a sand clock. Have you seen the sand clocks? Yeah, weird. Uh, to talk about like time and how those years I was under the medication, I like, I don't remember anything. It's like it never happened. And like you can see, I have no eyes again. And this is the fan favorite. It's called She's Long Gone. It's also te taken in Texas. Uh, this is my friend, Balvina. And this was literally seven minutes before, like a huge, like, not, tsun not tsunami, obviously, but like a huge thunderstorm or whatever. And she was really mad. She was like, let's please go. And I was like, no, we have to take the perfect shot. So yeah, it's like literally the calm before the storm. And there's also a really... Uh, uh, intense narrative because uh, at first I was completely like dumbed down like um, I don't know how to explain but the everything pro starts progressing as you we I go along in the series and this is called it's the title this is a feeling you thought you had your repressed it's about sexuality it's about it has a double meaning because it's talking about the feeling because okay so when I started making this project I was I wanted to think about this time the time that I spent like at 13 14 16 17 but I'm right now 24 so I thought I had forgotten about it but it's also it's really traumatizing still like that I can't remember fully some years of my life in high school I thought I had repressed them I thought I had forgotten about it but <coughs> if I sit down and think about it, it's like well like I haven't completely um, healed from that, but yeah. And this is a taste of blood, and it's about the long, the longing for sexuality and and having it repressed in this really Catholic strict household. And you could never ask questions about anything, no curiosity, n nothing. And then it's so it's about sexuality, sexuality, and sexuality because these three go together because it's like a hand wanting this 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 is wanting to hold or grab or feel like an, another person but yeah that's why they go together but this one is called disclosure and like i said it's um it's blurry it's red so it's about sexuality it's about longing for somebody else or a companion or whatever and yeah, this is about also censorship of the hum of the female body, of sexuality. Yes, and this is called every single night. 
um yes it's it in my head it was like so in my head it's really weird so i pictured this image as a box there was a box in my head and everything was dark but if you go inside the box with like a flashlight and you suddenly see like a demon or something like like you get scared that's what that's how i kind of thought about this that's why there's like a um, spotlight but everything's dark i felt it was a box and i was looking at the box with a flashlight and then, and then there was this, this kind of demon thing with no eyes no mouth yeah and then finally i was awake because i stopped taking the medication and so this is the only picture where the eyes aren't blacked out because after i came off the medication i, I could finally see i could finally feel but still i decided to leave this black and white and it's still super blurry and grainy because that's when i figured out that i there was a type of dependency and because i didn't really know myself without being while being sober i like for the longest time i just knew myself being this like quiet like dull person so when i went off of it i was like who is this person and it was just finding myself again at like 19 so yeah and that's the series oh i forgot so when i was here i felt i always felt like the series wasn't done and i hadn't like closed it so i i was like i need to do something else so i made a video that is called claws with a heart um and my friend sam helped me make make it i did it in that the room the black room and it's basically when i was younger i always have like little tics where i like express my anxiety or whatever sometimes like pulling my hair it, others is biting my nails but i also when i was little i would scratch my back and sometimes i would do it like unintentional and i would make myself bleed but that that was before and so i that's a video it's me just scratching my back i tried to make myself bleed but then i couldn't so i was like fuck it so yeah <laughs> yeah so yes um and so in summary this this series was born out of pain and out of the curiosity to learn more about my past self and heal because once i t when i talk about the series it's like m me hugging myself and being like oh it's it's, it's gonna be okay like you're cool it's, it's fine so yeah so i want to say thank you so much to saratan <coughs> samantha lisondo georgia green my friends and family and the people people's names here yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> kike ruiz obviously yeah. and my friends from back home and and yes thank I, you for listening uh, of course we have questions. I, I have can, can i start yes i have two questions mm -hmm. one is you are really fast and quick speaking about your work but your really? work has a, a temporality that is much longer and uh -huh. it's much more peaceful uh -huh. if you don't get the context that is really strange like your uh, will to live and the uh -huh. temporality of work is two different times like the photograph remains and you have much more time and the second question i have uh -huh. is uh, you're subject of a lot of, 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 a lot of photographs mm -hmm. but you're not in the most complex ones mm -hmm. why does it happen Okay. Because you're, you're a subject of mm -hmm. the majority, mm -hmm. but then when it's more bodily uh -huh. or whatever, you come up, you step out, and you don't exist on the uh -huh. work. So if it's self-biographical, I have these questions. Can I go back to the okay. question? Okay. Honestly, that la the first question I really I kind of didn't understand it. I think it wasn't really a question. Ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> ah, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay, so the second question is actually, I've been asked that before <coughs> because like it's when my work is anti-censorship, but then I, I'm obviously not gonna be here because my mom would murder me. So like, I can't, that's why I'm obviously not here. So I'm... Yeah, and also I think your presence is there by, for what you uh, speak with us in uh -huh. this month the lightning process, the choosing of the place, the choosing of, I mean, people come uh -huh. to see you, <laughs> create this terror, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. because I think they are very, they do bring this 
or kind of imaginary and mm -hmm. you feel this. So mm -hmm. you are there even if you're not yeah. there somehow. Yes. And this, for, for example, this video is scandalous. Like, th this is the closest thing I'll ever come to. Like, me willing to do this was too much. Like, literally too much. And so that's why I, I try to be in all of the pictures. For example, I never, never, never use models. I don't like to use models. If, they're, if the people I choose to, to be in my series, they have to complement the narrative. So it's not like I'm going to choose a pretty person. Like, I don't care about pretty people. For example, this girl has to be here. It has to be her because she also had a similar background to me and we spent hours talking about it. And, and the, the, because she would not usually pose nude and, the way, and she chose to pose nude in my project because she felt so, like, she, she felt my project and everything. So it makes sense. We and naked. yeah <laughs> yeah and and yet this one is also my friend who she has a lot of a lot heavy heavy Sorry. heavy anxiety issues heavy depression issues so she really connected to the project and she's like i really want to be in this picture can i be her and i was like yes like completely and and also this this person right here it, 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 he's, um, he had to be in the project, it had to be him, because at the time there was something happening, and, and yeah, I don't want to... I'm actually curious, I think it's very interesting the way you interact also with the space and you decide mm -hmm. to take the darker room, and I think the display set up is quite interesting. Can you speak a bit about it, how the exhibition works? Yes, oh. so the exhibition, I don't know if all of you, I think everybody here has gone. So it's everything, the lights are off completely. So it was also the way I wanted, I thought about it in my head because I, I would feel completely isolated and I want the viewer to experience what I felt as well. It's like a, Sam said it, it's like a multi-sensory experience. So you have to take your flashlight and come up close to each photograph to actually look at them to almost smell the images smell the space and so yes because everything's dark and i want you to feel because you you maybe can trip you maybe can fall and hit your head like you don't know that and that's kind of what i felt the the insecurity of like am i okay am i not and i don't know i love i really love the space and i don't know it's funny how the world works because your space was something that I, I thought about in my dreams. Like, I, oh, I wish I could present this in a cave, like in a cave and it's dark and it's wet and it's damp and it's kind of similar. So it's amazing. Yay. Yes, of course, Georgia. <laughs> Exactly. Like you've taken this step exactly. away from this trauma and away from this sort of position where you have to like stay one step away from it because it's too personal and it's too much for say your family to see. Of course. Like that. And you've actually come here and then you said, well, I have this entire like ocean between me and these exactly. people uh -huh. and this place and these views and I can actually step up and do something completely different, which is really cool. And no, you, you said it best, like, I felt comfortable enough to just, like, open myself a little bit more to different techniques, to using my own body for things that I wouldn't have done back home. So, 
I don't know, I, I, I felt really comfortable. I felt like I had to because I always thought about this video. I had told Samantha like, oh, I really want to do this scratching about my back video. And but it's really scandalous. My mom will kill me. And but here I felt like you were doing art. People are so chill. And I was like, yeah. And you might think it's like whatever. But in my head, it's like the biggest deal in the world, which it's not going to be in five years. <coughs> but but yeah. But it's funny you haven't answered my question. Ah. <laughs> how, how does the time of your images is different mm -hmm. from the time of your personality? And for me, it's a, it's a big question because when I see your pictures, mm -hmm. when, when I, I, I take the, the light and I check them individually, they, are, they take much longer than the explanation that you give or the velocity that you have as a person. And for me, it's quite curious, these uh, two velocities. Okay, okay, okay. I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> but it's really interesting. Maybe Thank you so I'm much for your question. Ask, uh, how do you see yourself like... Um, how, how do you see your work going now that you are completely awake uh, uh -huh. and still carrying on all this uh, traumatic experience and having this horror imaginarium? Uh, where do you think your work goes and your personality? Oh, okay, okay, I get it. Okay, so, so I, I feel like, because I, I'm not really like this emo, like dark, per like no, I just consume a lot of horror movies and a lot of like violence news or whatever, but my personality isn't that way. Like I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> because at first you guys were like scared of me and Georgia was like, please don't kill me at night with a knife. <laughs> I was like, I am not, I promise you, I'm a flower. Like I'm, <laughs> Georgia said, please don't kill me with a knife, literally. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like everybody has this like little voice in their head that thinks about the worst possible scenario, but I choose to exploit that little voice. Well, I talk a lot, of, about I used to talk a lot about this in therapy and like how I'm I need to take that little person in my head like out and like heal through or use it through my art and yeah so I'm not really I'm not really like depressed all the time and like that no I'm actually really happy and I, I I'm really I don't know grateful to be here and everything but so, there's something in my in, in my head that needs to like exploit that dark side of me of course and it can be a part of you and uh -huh. we know you're you're funny and you <laughs> took uh, our artists and uh, let's see let's <laughs> we don't see you as mm -hmm. a creepy okay know? okay thank but you but you sign all of your instagram with blood that is true <laughs> that is true i I like to sign my work with blood, <laughs> with a tiny little speck of blood, because my grandfather did it, and I appropriated his way of signing stuff. And it's also really cathartic, I feel like. Like, it has my DNA. I don't know. So, so yeah. And you didn't reply what's, what's coming ah, okay. after, both in terms of um, shows or uh -huh. references, and what do you see your work going on? Okay. Thank you for your question. It's a great question. So personally, I'm headed back home. Well, no, I'm, I am going to go to Paris for a week and then I'm heading back home because I have to work. I work uh, as a teacher, uh, a teacher in photography, and I work at a marketing agency. And I really want this this project, this series, to continue growing and, and being in other places. Actually, um, in June, some of the images here were in a gallery in Berlin. Then in October, some of them are going to be in a gallery in Denmark. And then today, not yesterday, I got the news that some of my work will be in a gallery in Rome. So that's amazing and that's so exciting for me because I love this series so much. It's my baby and I just want to keep growing. But then also I, I was told by a lot of people to let it die and it has to die. Eventually it, it has to, I have to close the book, like I have to close the chapter. And that is why I have my future series uh, called Bodega Inferno. This is one of the pieces. It's about my pandemic nightmares because in, in the pandemic I had horrible, horrible death-like nightmares. And because I thought people, 
when I would sleep, I, everybody in my family would die of the coronavirus, or I would get coronavirus, I, my skin would fall off, things would like, like, I, I actually have, I just want to show you very quickly, um, the production of my, of my new project called Boy Inferno, and it's all about my paranoia and then a lot of things a lot of things but i want to show you okay so this is what i have so far but it's still super ongoing and and yeah it's about me trying to reenact my nightmares through photography i would but without there being a lot of um people i want it to be more like like weird like for me this was a face and I I would have nightmares and I would wake up and write them on my the phone. Tree one for me is amazing. The, this one? The tree with the hands. Ah, thank you. I yeah. I would have this recurring dream like little tiny hands would follow me and want to like pull my hair. And interestingly enough, they all stopped when I had COVID. So I ha would have I had for three months, like horrible nightmares, but they all stopped when I got COVID. So yeah, I, I'm trying to recreate all my nightmares and make them into pictures. Thank you. So yeah, any more questions? Okay, so I I always change the names of my my images like seventeen hundred times. So for, like initially they'll be called like blah blah blah, but then after like two weeks I start putting things together and I look at the image and what does this really make me feel like? What does it make me feel? And I just sit on it, sit on it, sit on it. Sometimes I look at the dictionary and look at cool cool English words and yes. And actually, for me, it's funny that the video here doesn't have a title. Yeah. There are only yours. Yes. It doesn't have a title, which I don't understand what it is. Cl okay, so claws are like, a like a claw, a, las garras, okay. and it has a little heart because I'm kind of claws. I feel it, it is kind of it can can be goring, but it has a little heart playfulness, like ha claws. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just also like the whole the theme of like red. Mm -hmm. and then, like, clothes and also yes. Back yes, it's like it's a sexual connotation. Yes. Um, to as well as like the idea of protection mm -hmm. and like stuff like that. So I feel like yeah. Yeah, mom, I'm Maybe sorry. Like, uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is a there there is usually sexual connotation in my work, but I don't like to say it because then my mom is is seeing this live Instagram. I mean, if I was your mom, I wasn't worried about sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the work uh, is really working on on a dark imaginary one, which is something yeah. no parents would like. That yeah. Butterflies and yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so actually, this this series was really controversial in my family. That nobody really liked it and they were like why do you have to air dirty laundry this way like please like maybe let, let's not do that maybe talk about like the beautiful mountains that are in Mexico <laughs> oh and and yes but then they were like we're not gonna shut her up so we're just gonna ignore yeah no I love my mom I I, I do I do <laughs> But it's difficult to be yeah. trying to be an artist and mm -hmm. please your parents. That's yeah. what it is, I think, in general. Mm -hmm. like both on economics, sexuality, uh -huh. politics, <laughs> everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's so. part of the growing process. Yes, and well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for coming, oh my God. And thank just you. my Instagram is Brenda Fernandez 505 and my website that I love the it's brendamaria.com and there's i have a blog and my diaries there and you can see everything i hide from everyone in my <laughs> in my website all the dirty stuff, all the dirty stuff. thank you oh.